Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, OSIRIS-REx made its very important delivery to Earth. Its sample return capsule straight across the morning sky over California, Nevada, into Utah, where it slowed down and descended gently to the Earth under a parachute, although there are some questions about exactly how that parachute worked this time. OSIRIS-REx launched seven years ago on board uh, the rarely seen Atlas V411, which I have to point out is really cool because it uses only one solid rocket booster, therefore it has to power slide off the pad as a sort of trick right at the start of a mission full of cool tricks. Cyrus Rex's bag of tricks is all about investigating asteroids, specifically this asteroid called Bennu. This is a primitive carbonaceous asteroid from the earliest days of the solar system, but beyond just investigating, it was supposed to take a sample, and I covered this obviously previously. This had a ta um, you know touch and go sample arm, right? Tag Sam. It would go down to the surface, and it was supposed to touch the surface, but it turns out the surface was so weakly bound that it literally blew six tons of material out of the asteroid and overfilled its container. So they closed the container up and sent the spacecraft home. And now a few years later, it finally got to Earth and it was time to deliver the capsule. Now, some of you might wonder why NASA was interested in getting chunks of an asteroid delivered to Earth when asteroids seem to do a pretty good job of delivering chunks of themselves to Earth with uh, some regularity. However, re-entry through the atmosphere is a somewhat violent process that tends to break the object up and many things do not survive. And we have learned a lot from meteorites, specifically rocky and iron meteorites which have hard structure and the interior can survive. For example, we know that Martian meteorites came from Mars because there are little gas bubbles inside them that contain gases that match the isotopic composition of the Martian atmosphere. But most asteroids aren't stony or iron, they're these primitive carbonaceous objects with uh, material that has been relatively unprocessed, that it was, it was never part of a larger planetary body. Asteroids would form and coalesce into large objects and they would get hot from that process that would melt the material and form rocks and sometimes it would allow an iron core to form. That's where we get these stony and iron meteorites from. But the smaller objects may have never been part of a larger body for long enough for this to happen. So that is why they were interested in acquiring material from one of these objects. Because it's never been uh, like compressed and heated, it's not particularly strong, so it doesn't survive re-entry. And that's why you needed a spacecraft to go down, get some, put it in a bucket, and then bring it back protected. And so on Saturday, OSIRIS-REx found itself on a collision course with the Earth. Hours before impact, it released the sample return camera, and then the spacecraft made a diversion maneuver that will slingshot it past the Earth and eventually bring it to an encounter with Apophis. This is a stony type asteroid which will have an extraordinarily close approach to the Earth in 2029. To reflect the changed goals of the mission, OSIRIS-REx will get renamed to OSIRIS-APEX. But yesterday was all about the sample return, which was aimed for a military test range in Utah. And NASA was able to deliver live video of the re-entry, of the parachute deployment and the landing, thanks to having an aircraft in the area. They had a WB-57 at a very high altitude orbiting the area. Here's its ADSB trace showing a beautiful pink trail. Why is it pink? Well, maybe it's a gender reveal party and the sample is a girl, but no, it's because it's encoded for altitude and all the coolest planes leave pink trails. Anyway, the WB-57 has special cameras for observing these kind of entry events. So you can look in the top right and see some cool numbers like, uh, first of all, the, the date. That's very good because you can actually map it back to its position on the ADSB trace. You can also see the field of view of this, so it's 1.15 degrees. It has multiple cameras. After switching from broadcasting the thermal one, they switched over to a more visual one. You can see that it was actually emitting light as it was streaking through the atmosphere at thousands of miles per hour, generating heats of thousands of degrees. Now in the top left, they have an OSIRIS-REx landing timer. I think that was pretty much somebody hit a stopwatch the moment they heard about atmospheric entry because it was supposed to take about 13 minutes from initial entry interface to actually landing on the surface. So early on, yeah, it's basically flying through the atmosphere like a capsule. It's losing a lot of velocity, emitting a lot of heat. And all the deceleration is strictly down to that heat shield. There's no other uh, mechanisms to slow it down. 
goes through max heating, max g-forces will be something like 35 g's, which while is uh, pretty rough for when you're trying to recover material that has been on the surface of an asteroid for billions of years, um, it's the best they could do, I guess, given the circumstances. The capsule design, by the way, is derived from the same design used for the Stardust and Genesis missions, which were recovered like particles of solar wind and comets. Uh, Genesis, of course, is the one where the parachute never deployed, and instead of being carefully captured under a helicopter, it slammed into the desert floor. Thankfully, they still recovered some good science from it. But as it happens, the engineers may have copied too much of the Genesis capsule, because during the descent, once it gets to about 100,000 feet, 30 kilometers, it was supposed to deploy a small stabilizing drogue parachute. And that would be around this time during the uh, entry. However, as far as we can tell from the footage, there is no evidence that the drogue chute deployed. If we skip forward a few minutes, this aircraft is still tracking the capsule, and in the background you'll start to see things like cloud and the horizon, indicating that the capsule is now falling past the aircraft, that's about 48,000 feet, and continuing to descend. There is This is the point at which the capsule would be closest to the aircraft, and this is the point you would absolutely expect to see some kind of drogue shoot there, and there is no evidence. Now, to be clear, this video is being transmitted from the aircraft in real time, and it is a 1950s era design, but it does have modern, you know, transmission technology. Now, the engineers, they will get to look at the raw video that was recorded on the aircraft. That may show some detail, which isn't evidence here, but I don't think the drogue shoot deployed. And so about this point, yeah, I was definitely feeling those Genesis vibes, the, the capsule just falling towards the surface and tumbling. It was supposed to deploy the drogue at about 100,000 feet, and it was supposed to deploy the main parachute at 5,000 feet. And part of the main parachute deployment process is that it gets pulled out by the drogue chute. The drogue chute has a relatively small cross-section. It's primarily there for stabilization rather than deceleration, but it does increase the drag by about, I think, 40% if I've read the, uh, the graphs correctly. So this thing would have been falling faster and further than uh, an aircraft, or sorry, than the spacecraft if it did not have that uh, drogue chute deployed. Incidentally, by the way, because of these problems, the Mars Sample Return Mission wants to just have this capsule land on the desert floor without a parachute to solve any concerns over this. The good news is, eventually, after a, a glitch in the video at this point, we did actually see the main parachute pop open. This was earlier on the timeline than you would expect, uh, but that's actually consistent with not having a drogue adding 30-40% you know, drag. Uh, now, during the live stream, the commentator apparently got some information and told us that actually the main parachute had deployed at 20,000 feet. And I'm going to say, I think that is a mis mistake. It is not what happened. I don't know where the 20,000 feet number came from. Maybe the drogue did come out at 20,000 feet and we just didn't see it because of the amount of uh, back clutter by that point. Because if you remember, the aircraft is looking down and there's a lot of other stuff going on in the background. I even went so far as to line up the point where the aircraft was on the sky and the point that it was looking at on the ground and draw a line and try to figure out what altitude the capsule must have been at to deploy. And it is probably below that. So anyway, I think because it was moving a bit faster than expected and because it had to go through a full drogue and then parachute deployment, I think it ended up taking a lot less time from main chute deployment to landing. And that meant that the whole thing got here about three minutes early. So maybe that was just consistent with the entire mission overperforming. Remember when it reached into the asteroid and grabbed a sample and accidentally like went deep down under the surface and then overfilled its container? Yeah, so they got more than they wanted. They touched down pretty much on target and they arrived three minutes early. It's just consistent with Osiris Rex trying to impress us all. Now, the full recovery process did take a long time. There was a lot of concern about, you know, perhaps unexploded you know, pyrotechnics that are used in various parts of the uh, spacecraft. They recovered the parachute right away, incidentally, and apparently there's people that are going to be interested in looking at the parachute to see how a parachute that's been packed for seven years in space and uh, exposed to the space environment, uh, how it 
performs, how it may have changed. But yeah, the recovery process generally involved checking everything was okay, taking samples of the site, and then wrapping it in a tarp, making the world's most expensive, I don't know, baked potato with very interesting filling. Uh, that was then airlifted over to the recovery center, to the temporary clean room that they set up, where they could then start taking it apart. It's extraordinarily important to understand the environment to which this material has been exposed. Like when the Apollo moon rocks came back, they kept on finding water in those samples and they kept on presuming that it was contamination from the Earth somehow. And of course, since then, we've learned that there is in fact water on the moon. It's possible that some of those signatures weren't in fact contamination. So very important for them to fully understand the environment so that they can accurately analyze this material. One of the first things they're going to do is take a gas sample off the sample container, which has was captured in vacuum, but over time it may have off-gassed something uh, due to just heat, you know, thermal cycling. And so they're going to be interested to see whether there is something in that. And when the material is taken out of the canister and allowed to come up to atmospheric pressures, it will probably be in a dry nitrogen atmosphere environment because nitrogen is a relatively inert gas. And because it's so non-reactive, gaseous nitrogen is unlikely to exist on asteroids because there's nothing for it to, to hold it in there. So after initial processing, the capsule is going to go to Johnson Space Center where the real work can actually begin and samples can be sent out around the world to teams which have amazing instrumentation which can analyze this stuff. Instrumentation which is simply not the kind of thing that you can fly on a spacecraft and that's why we do sample return. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.